Hi, this is Rich Troxler, a.k.a. Rich Trox. This is the third of my View from the Beach series of videos on learning to read a beach for the purpose of identifying the most likely spots to catch fish from. If you haven't already done so, you should watch the first two videos of the series, Understanding Wave and Wave Action, and Identifying Sandbars, Troughs, and Cuts, prior to viewing this video. It will help in understanding some of the concepts presented here. Deciding where to fish on the open beach can be a daunting task at times. In the second video of the series, I discussed sandbars and their component parts. And sandbars are definitely good structures to fish. But what happens when there are no sandbars in the stretch of beach you are working? This is where learning to identify less obvious structure comes into play. A baseball analogy would be something like this. Sandbars and deep troughs with cuts are the home runs of fishing. They're the big score. Smaller structures are the little ball of fishing, the way of producing some fish when there doesn't appear to be any obvious fish holding structure around. Try this experiment. Put a half dozen minnows in a five gallon bucket with water and watch what they do. Then drop a penny to the bottom and leave them undisturbed for about five minutes. When you come back, the minnows will all be around the penny. When presented with the bland white world of the bucket, they went to the only thing that was different, and that's why when fishing a bland, nondescript beach, finding the only structure in the area can make a big difference. So what are these less obvious structures, you ask? The big four in my book are holes, submerged points, lips, and rips, and their various combinations. So let's take a look at how these structures reveal themselves. Holes are probably the most overlooked structure on any beach. While beaches with well-developed sandbars are relatively rare, holes are fairly common on most beaches. You may not see them, but they are usually there. Nature rarely does linear, so the bottom contour of any beach is not likely to be uniform and flat. There will always be dips and high spots and other features that affect wave action and current. They may not appear to be profound to us, but fish will know they are there, and in the absence of larger forms of structure, will gravitate to them just like the minnows in the bucket did to the penny. At low tide, holes will often reveal their whereabouts, but they can be difficult to find at the higher stages of the tide because other conditions can affect the wave action that gives up their location. As I've stated before, the best conditions for observing wave action are onshore breezes and incoming tide, basically everything moving in the same direction or as close to it as possible. So you roll out onto a beach and you're riding along looking at the shoreline as you go. You come across a small cove where the shoreline dips in towards you and you decide to take a closer look. You look out on the ocean and notice waves breaking a fair distance out on either side of the cove. As you watch the waves, you notice that they continue towards shore as spilling breakers and then deteriorate into wash as they get near the shore. But as you look straight out from the middle of the cove, you notice the waves cresting much closer to shore, or maybe breaking on the shore as plunging breakers. If this is what you see, then you just located a hole. It may only be two or three feet deeper than the surrounding bottom, but many times that's all you need. If the fish are in the area, then they will know it's there and they will gravitate to it. Here are some pictures of what holes look like at the higher stages of the tide. Note how the waves break further out on either side of the holes. This is key in identifying their whereabouts. This last picture was taken under the ideal conditions I spoke of earlier, which resulted in calm, consistent wave patterns. First note the pre-break wave rising up on the right side of the picture. Then note the flat water over the deeper section of the hole and the plunging breaker right up on shore. If waves are behaving in this manner, then you are looking at a hole. It may appear subtle at first, but once you know what you are looking at, they become easy to spot. These pictures show what holes might look like at the lower stages of the tide. Here's some video of a hole at low tide. Notice the cove shape of the shoreline surrounding the bowl-shaped depression, both of which would be covered at high tide and hard to detect. Also note the way the water reacts in the hole, running backwards out to sea, or in other words, a rip. This happens because water seeks its own level. 
The water from the waves breaking on the shallower edges of the hole move towards the deepest point in the hole and then follows the hole's bottom contour out to sea. This is just a fledgling hole, one that is still worth fishing at high tide, but not very big yet. Over time, the water action I described above may continue to scour out the bottom sand of the hole, either moving it out further to sea to form a sandbar or off to the side forming a point. As the hole grows, so too will other types of associated structure. Sand doesn't disappear, it always goes somewhere. Here's another video of a hole at low tide that almost resembles a sandbar cut in trough because it cuts back in along the shore for a short distance. Several people have asked me what the difference is between a hole and a sandbar cut, and this is a good question as they are very similar. The difference is that a cut is the deeper area between two sandbars and is fed by the water draining from the sandbar's troughs. A hole does not have a sandbar and trough system feeding it. It's typically just a deeper area along a sandbar-free stretch of shoreline. It may have one nearby, or more often a point nearby, but I'll cover that later in the video. Also, note the large amount of broken shells and rocks on the beach between the waterline and the high tide mark. This is another clue that waves and water currents have been having an impact on the shoreline. Concentrations of shells and rocks are a good thing when it comes to locating beach structure. Now let's move on to a common neighbor of holes, that being submerged points. As I mentioned before, sand doesn't disappear, it always goes somewhere. And when the wave action from a storm creates a hole, it's very common for a submerged point to form on one side or the other of the hole. What I have found is that depending on your geographic location, meaning the orientation of your stretch of beach in relation to the prevailing tidal and sweep currents, points tend to form consistently on the same sides of holes. So points and holes tend to cohabitate together on many beaches. Where you find one, you usually find the other. Points are usually pretty easy to locate. Just go find some surfers as they tend to like the way waves break on points. The following diagrams illustrate how waves break on a typical point. The light blue area represents the bottom contour of the point. In this example, there is also a hole on the left side of the point represented by the green area. Take a minute to note the depths of the various areas around the point so that you can correlate them to the way the waves break throughout the entire area. It's by recognizing the way waves break that bottom contour reveals itself. Although the artwork won't win any awards, this should give you an idea of what to look for. The three colors on the key in the upper left denote the type of wave formations. As a wave rolls in from the ocean, the first place it breaks is at the tip of the point. This is where the bottom contour has risen to the point where it interacts with the wave causing it to break. The wave continues to roll in on either side of the point tip without breaking. As the wave moves towards shore, the break widens following the contour of the point. As the bottom comes up or becomes shallower, the wave interacts with it and breaks. In this diagram, the wave is not broken over the hole yet and continues to roll in towards shore. On either side of the hole and point, the wave begins to break in relation to the bottom depth. The wave section over the middle of the point has become a spilling breaker as it continues towards shore. At this point, the wave over the point continues towards shore as a spilling breaker while the wave over the hole is yet to break or is very near breaking. The wave on either side of the point and hole is either fully breaking or has already broken and is pushing towards shore as a spilling breaker. Lastly, the wave over the hole finally breaks. The wave over the point is reduced to nothing more than wash, and the wave on either side of the structures is finishing its journey as a spilling breaker, soon to be wash as it nears the shore. Based on the structure and associated depths I've diagrammed, this is what I would expect to see in terms of wave patterns. Conversely, and more importantly, if I were observing waves breaking in this manner, this is how I would envision the bottom contour to look like. It doesn't always look like this at every stretch of beach, and every piece of structure is different, but what you observe on the surface will tell you what the bottom looks like, and that's really the point, pun intended. The value of points in terms of fishable structure is that they provide a place for fish to drive bait up against. Because of the shallower bottom contour, waves tend to break on points, creating a lot of turbulence which smaller bait fish have trouble swimming in. This provides a feeding advantage for larger predatory species. Because of this, the side of the point that has a hole next to it is typically the side of the point I would concentrate most of my fishing efforts. As mentioned earlier, when the ocean gets to working on a stretch of beach, many times the structure comes in combinations. Sand doesn't disappear, it always goes somewhere. 
Most structure can be recognized by wave action at high tide, but for the sake of clarity, most of the following pictures are at the lower stages of the tide. Sometimes wave action creates a series of small points along a stretch of beach. This is a fairly common structure found along my former stomping grounds, the South Shore beaches of Long Island. There will be one after another, 100 feet to 100 yards apart. In this picture, note the two small points in their associated holes or coves. Also note how the high tide line mimics the structure revealed at low tide. If the tide was full high, the combination of wave action and shoreline contour would tell you where those points and holes were. Sometimes wave action and current create one big point. This is a massive point with a big offshore sandbar. The channel that runs between the point and the offshore bar was deep, even at low tide, because of the amount of water that got funneled through it during tide changes. At high tide, the waves breaking on the outer bar and the water action over the point would indicate that those structures were there. The channel would be where you would want to fish. Here's another point sandbar combination. This time the sandbar is to the left of the point creating a trough channel combination. And again, at high tide this structure would show its presence by wave and wave action. The waves would break on the bar and reform over the trough resulting in small shore break along the trough. The same waves would probably not break at all as they rolled into the channel unless a strong rip current was present and would break much more energetically near the shore. Other waves would break on the tip of the point, progressively widening as they become spilling breakers approaching the shore, and eventually nothing but wash. The channel and the trough would be where I would focus my attention. This last series of pictures came from the outer banks of North Carolina and show a combination sandbar hole and point. The sandbar is very close to shore and has a small trough, so I would focus my attention on the hole. The reason is that there would likely be significant current in the form of a rip created by the water moving through the trough and the water coming off the point. All of these examples can be identified at the higher stages of the tide by understanding and observing waves, wave action, and currents. The last two items on the less obvious structure list are lips and rips. They're the red-headed stepchildren of structure because nobody pays them much attention, but I'll give them the quick once over here. Lips are present to one degree or another on pretty much every beach that has waves. A lip is basically a shallow, nearshore drop-off typically caused by the breaking of waves. Some move with the tide and some don't, and while most are very shallow, occasionally you come across some that are deeper and don't move with the tide. These are the ones that are worth investigating further when fishing. Finding them is not easy at high tide, but they do reveal themselves at low tide. Here are a couple of pictures of non-moving lips at low tide. They're not very deep, but they should give you an idea of what I'm describing. They look like small troughs behind sandbars within 10 yards of the high tide mark. They could actually be considered tiny troughs, but in the context of this video I call them lips. At high tide, any fish that moves up into the surf line to forage for crustaceans or bait fish will travel along the lip while doing so. Here's a video of a non-moving lip at low tide. The water in that lip is probably not much more than a foot or so deeper than the preceding bottom, but when the tide comes in, any fish making a shore run will use it like a highway. So when fishing a plug, always fish it right up to the shore if a lip is present, and the same goes for bait. And while lips can produce in the day, they are much more likely to produce in low light conditions or nighttime when fish are feeling more comfortable in the shallows. Most people know rips as the backward flow of water that sucks swimmers out to sea, and that is exactly what they are. They could be considered a soft structure, a term coined by a friend of mine known on several of the Northeast Coast fishing websites as Ed the Red. Soft structure is defined as the interface of water is moving in different directions or different speeds. And while rips themselves are soft structure, they are typically caused by some sort of hard structure. Rips will often form in cuts between sandbars as the water filling the troughs finds a path back to the sea. They can also form in holes, particularly those with points on one side of them. Jetties and rock groins used to control beach erosion can also create rips if the sideways tidal flow pushes against them. Rips are usually pretty easy to spot. Aside from the water simply looking different, they frequently produce ripples as the current flows back out to sea. Any sea foam generated by nearby wave breaks will often get swept backwards out to sea also. 
Rips like any strong current cause problems for small bait fish, which is why larger predatory fish, which have no problem swimming in current, tend to key on them, particularly if they are also the source of deeper water, like a sandbar cut or hole. So to wrap this all up, all structure along a beach is important, some more than others, but all should be looked at and considered when deciding where to fish. And the best way to find structure is to learn what the waves, water, and currents are telling you about the bottom contour. It takes some time and practice, but it is well worth the effort. My version of life is that catching fish is fun, but catching fish from spots you figure out on your own is twice the fun. That's my view from the beach, so until next time, be well and catch them up.